communion, Jesus Christ and God the Father are saying, I love you. They're saying, I forgive you. And they're saying, supper is ready. See, this is known as the Lord's Supper. It's the communion table. And I really desire for you, if you've been a part of a thousand of these in the past, I want you to prepare your heart to hear and see something different today in the name of Jesus Christ. So let's go to Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 14. This is what it says. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Say table. The title of today's message is, is the table and all that that means. Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. That should be our attitude every time we approach communion. There should be an eagerness. There should be a hunger. There should be a desire. There should be an excitement. There should be an anticipation of what is actually going to happen during this particular service. That's what Jesus had in mind. He says, I tell you, now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. But here at this table, say table. But here at this table, sitting among us as a friend is the man who will betray me. For it has been determined that the son of man must die. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's a privilege to be able to pray to you again and again and again and again. That's not by accident. It's not to fill time. It's because we desire your presence in our midst. So when we conclude praise and worship, we pray. When we anoint someone for ministry, we pray. When we open up the preaching portion of the service, we pray not out of religiosity, not out of some some ritual, but because we believe that you're listening. We believe that you are present. We believe that you are here and that you have a plan to do something in our midst today. I pray this, I believe this in Jesus' holy and precious name. And together, everybody says, amen. Three simple words that are all related to the word communion that I want you to to file away in your brain today. And the first is, is just the first half of communion, and that's the word come. When it comes to communion, when it comes to this supper, when it comes to to the Lord's table, Jesus Christ Himself is inviting you to come, to come to the table to literally sit down and take a load off. My only regret today is that there aren't enough tables for everybody here. My only regret today is that we don't have about about 200 tables or at least 150 tables with chairs wrapped around them so that we could all sit down and actually spend some time in God's presence and in one another's presence. Because that is actually more accurate to what this meal is supposed to be all about. When I was a a young child, I grew up in South Dakota, and it was oftentimes very, very cold. And so I'd come home after basketball practice or football practice in the middle of the winter, and and we'd sit down for, for dinner, and I'd still have my coat on, and my dad would say, take off your coat and stay a while. Well, guess what? 
When you see the emblem set before you, God is inviting you to sit down and spend a little time in his presence to slow your mind, to slow your your heartbeat, to to slow your, your, your imaginations running wild. Our culture seems to equate busyness with success. Anybody like In-N-Out burgers? It's really funny, Um, I I hope you really learned something about the communion meal today, but whenever I mention a restaurant, when I'm out there greeting people, people say, I know where I'm going to lunch today. Because they, so many are go to In-N-Out today, but have you ever noticed that at In-N-Out, they will ask you if you're gonna eat this in your car. That's because one in every five meals is now eaten in a car. It's eaten on the run. They actually give you a a little box and they give you a little table placement so that you can put it in your lap and you can just eat your food right there. Our culture dictates that everything needs to be done fast and on the move. And if you're not in a hurry, you're not accomplishing much. Some churches actually have drive-through communions now. Yeah, it's a real live thing. Now, in Italy, on the other hand, they have a slow food movement, a desire to sit down and enjoy your food. I read this survey 60 years ago. The average mealtime in America was 90 minutes. Today, the average mealtime is 11 minutes. In some parts of the United States of America, the average breakfast time is two minutes. That's all the time we're sitting down. Let me give you some advantages to slowing down. Number one, you can actually taste your food. That sounds like a good thing, don't don't you think? I mean, food is about more than fuel. You will hear me say that during a fast, if you're going to participate in the Daniel fast, that that food becomes nothing more than funeral. Or funeral, it's a funeral when you're fasting. It's definitely a funeral when you're fasting, right? (laughs) See, we know, don't we, that food is supposed to be more than just fuel. We know it's meant for our enjoyment. It's meant for our pleasure. But you can't enjoy it if you're just inhaling it. We need to slow down. Uh, Did you know that the longer you take to eat, you actually lose weight? You gain weight by eating quickly. It aids your digestion by slowing down when you eat. Communion is meant to be a full sensory experience. That means you're supposed to smell the bread. You're supposed to smell the the grape juice, the grapes. You're you're, you're supposed to look at it and touch it and, and feel it. It is a full sensory experience because you're coming not just to a an empty table, but a table that's full of food so that you can eat. How many have already eaten today? Let me see your hands. How many are gonna eat later on today? This afternoon, tonight? See, everybody eats. Let me show you how important eating really is. Not just to to our physical well-being, but I bet you most of you married people, your first date involved a meal. Amen, I like that. That must have been a good first date, huh? Some of you have closed business deals around a meal. After a wedding, there is usually a reception where people eat a a meal of some kind. They've discovered that when children sit down five nights a week with their parents and sit around a table, that their grades go up, their drug usage goes down, their weight goes down, their mental health is better, and their family relationships are improved. In some countries of the world, a meal, dinner time especially, is treated as sacred. How much more important is it to treat this meal as sacred? Now, I've got nothing against having communion after a service. 
I've got nothing against having communion during the praise and worship time because it is an act of praise and worship. Those are both appropriate. But every now and then, we need to take time out and just have communion. It should be the focus. It should be what we're really thinking about because this is a spiritual meal. It's a place where we get to know God. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I'm God. Many times during communion, we, we take a few moments and we contemplate our own lives and we think about our relationship with God. God wants to reveal something of his nature to you today. John 6, 35, I love this verse. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. Wow. Jesus is saying that that if you understand communion, if you really get what this is all about, all of your lusting, all of your, your battling, all of your striving, all of your desiring will be satisfied in Jesus Christ. And this is supposed to be a reminder of that, that life's not about your job. Life's not about the Silicon Valley. Life's not about the the busyness and the hurriedness of life. Life is all about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, so communion is a time to come to a table, come to a meal, and come to Jesus Christ himself. Come to Jesus. In 1939, a man by the name of Andrew Blackwood said this, the Lord's Supper should be the crowning service in the church and thus be earth's nearest approach to heaven. The nearest approach to heaven. See, what's interesting is is some denominations believe that the bread and the grape juice literally become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Some fellowships like our own believe that it's symbolic But in that thought that it's purely symbolic, we lose the significance of the presence of God in this moment. I believe that there's more that God wants to take place. This should be a sacred encounter with the Son of God himself. It's called a sacrament for a reason. It's one of our two sacraments because it's sacred, it's special. Today, I want to fundamentally change the way you even look at communion for the rest of your lives. Here's a verse most of us are familiar with. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who's heard this one before? Okay? Now, I grew up a long time ago in the church believing that that verse was for the unsaved. I I thought, you know, behold, I stand at the door at the knock. Come on, it's an altar call time. It's time for people to get saved and all that kind of stuff. But if you read the scripture, it's not even written to non-Christians. The verse is written to the church at Laodicea. The verse is written to the Christian church. And this is what Jesus says. Now pay attention. This is another translation. Now pay attention. I'm standing at the door and knocking. If any of you hear my voice and open the door, then I will come in to visit with you and to share a meal at your table and you will be with me. I've discovered that over the course of my life, there are times when when God is knocking at my door, where Jesus is trying to get my attention, and I'm so busy, I'm so hurried, I'm doing ministry, I'm preaching sermons, I'm going to conferences, I'm doing all of these things, and Christ is saying, I just want to spend some time with you. Can you take a few moments of your day and think about me? Can you take a few moments of your day and talk to me? Because if you're willing to do that, Jesus is promising a special experience even this morning in Jesus' name. God doesn't want you to take communion. He wants you to experience communion. Did you hear that? God doesn't want you to take communion. He wants you to experience it this morning. And if you do, three things can happen for you. Number one, you can be forgiven. Number two, you can be healed. Number three, you can be delivered in Jesus' name. Wow. That can happen during communion? Yes. This isn't just 
physical food. This is nourishment for your soul. We need to understand that, that, that God wants to forgive us of all, say all, all of our sins. So I find that people land in one of two camps. Camp number one is I don't need forgiveness. If you're here and you don't think that you need forgiveness, let me just say that the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That every single human being has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what it says in Romans 3, 23. It also tells us in 1 John chapter 1, speaking to Christians, that if you say you have no sin, that you're lying. So every single one of us this morning needs forgiveness. There's something in our hearts, something in our minds that, that needs to be repented of. It needs to be flushed out of our system. It needs to be washed away in the name of Jesus Christ. Psalm 130 verse 4 says this, but with you, God, there's forgiveness. See, I don't tell you that, that you have sinned because I'm trying to beat you over the head. I'm giving you good news. You have a fatal disease and God wants to cure you in the name of Jesus Christ. That's fantastic. And so God forgives. How does that happen? Ephesians chapter one, verse seven, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In other words, no matter how far you are away from God or how close you are to God, the simple gospel story is that Jesus was perfect and he paid the price on the cross. In other words, the Easter story, Jesus went to a cross, he was beaten, he was slain, he was crowned, he was stabbed, he was punched, he was spit on, all of these things. He bled his own blood, he died on the cross, and three days later he rose again. Who can say hallelujah? I mean, what an awesome story, the greatest story that's ever been told. And the Bible says that we're bought back or we're redeemed by his blood. His blood more precious than silver. His blood more precious than gold. His blood is, is the most precious thing. A lot of people don't even understand the blood of Jesus Christ. They're like, why do you Christians always talk about the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood? It's because that is the purest thing on the planet, Jesus' blood. And it redeems us. It buys us back. If we just say, Lord God, please forgive me. Now here's the other opposite side, is a lot of Christians I know tell me that they're a bad person. They're wallowing in guilt for sins that God has already forgiven you for. Or you think because you've sinned for the 800th time that God's not gonna forgive you again. Because your experience with human beings is if I violate their confidence more than two or three times, they don't trust me anymore. God is not like that. God will forgive in an instant. God has already forgiven you of sins in the future anyway, but you just have to reconcile that with him on a regular and daily basis in Jesus' name. So say, God, forgive me. The scripture says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to carry that load of guilt or sin. You can be forgiven of everything today. Number two, you can be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I have noticed that there has been a physical attack on my body in the spirit realm. You say, how does that happen? I don't understand it. I just know that the Bible plainly teaches that some of our physical ailments are as a result of demonic activity. And I believe that the devil is trying to take leaders and people out. He, I believe he does not want the gospel to move forward. And this is why this is a reminder that because of what Jesus Christ did, we can be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I've seen more miracles happen at communion than any other part of service I've been a part of. It says this in 1 Peter 2, 24, Christ carried our sins in his body on the cross. We already talked about that. So we should stop living for sin and start living for what is right. In other words, God wants change to take place. He wants us to start growing what we've been talking about all summer long. And you are healed because of his wounds. See, we, we neglect that second part so often. God wants to heal our physical bodies. He wants to heal our minds also. That includes our emotions. That includes our addictions. 
He wants to remove those things that take us down. Romans 12, 2 says that he wants to renew our minds and he does that through the word of God. Who can say amen? amen. Number three is deliverance. I need deliverance today in Jesus' name. When I have that bread and that cup in my hand, I'm gonna be praying that I win the spiritual battle that has been upon me for the last week and a half, two weeks. I, I mean, the devil's been coming hot and heavy. I have been accused of things that aren't true. I have been uh, a, insulted in many ways uh, by, by people very, very close to me. And, and, and for a while there, I was thinking, why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? And then God says, you wrestle not against flesh and blood. Understand where the battle really is. We want to get angry at people. We want to be upset at people. The battle is not against people. It's against the devil and his minions. We need to beat him in Jesus' name. That's what God wants. Listen to this verse, Psalm chapter 23, verse five. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What? I, I've never read that before. It specifically says, as I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So when the battle is raging, when things look horrible, when they think impossible, when you're sinking or drowning, Jesus Christ says, I'm gonna prepare a table right in the middle of the battle in Jesus' name. That's what I'm reminded of when I come to communion, that my God has it all under control. The next verse says, surely mercy and love will chase after me all the days of my life. So literally God is, is trying to chase me down sometime to slow me down, to sit me at the table so that I can remember who's really in charge of all of this stuff. Amen. It's not me, it's him. He's the one who's completely in control. So God is saying, come, come to the table, come to this meal, come to Jesus Christ and experience community. Say community. See, the Italians say, ci beve solo si trosa. The one who drinks alone chokes. Did you know God says the same thing? Genesis 2.18, it's not good for man to be alone. It's the same idea. God wants us to get connected. One of my regrets about communion in the big church service is we're sitting in pews. This is not how it's supposed to be done. It's not you looking at me. We're supposed to be eye to eye looking at each other, sharing our stories, sharing our lives, communicating. I desire that every single person in this church be a part of some kind of life group, which is nothing more than a small group where people in, in groups of four or six or eight or 12 get together and begin to share life with one another. Pastor Matt has, has trained 122 uh, life group leaders for beginning this fall, and you can have communion in your life group. Now, before you say, oh, pastor, that's sacrilege, understand it's not sacrilege. If you read Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 5, you will discover that that was happening in the early church. People were connecting with one another. They, they were fellowshipping around a table. I, I need you to understand that the word communion in 1 Corinthians is the Greek word koinonia. In other words, communion and fellowship are the exact same Greek word. Communion's about fellowship. It's about getting together. It's about sharing our lives. Verse 17 says this, take this cup, it's a cup of wine, and share it with one another. We're not just, I need you to get this mental image. Think about Thanksgiving. Think about your, your kitchen. Think about your dining room. When you're passing the potatoes, you're, you're passing the butter, it goes around the table, right? And, and then it comes back to you eventually. When you're passing food, we're also passing bits of ourselves with every word and every story we tell. See, God's genius. 
This is no accident, no coincidence that one of, of our sacraments is based around a meal. Important things happen around a meal. Fellowship happens around a meal. So what does God want? He wants us talking. He wants us communicating with one another. He wants us listening to each other's stories. He wants us looking each other in the eye. Most people would agree that around the table is where you're most likely to find something out about another person that you didn't know. This is what I've discovered. Conversation leads to connection. The more you talk, the more you connect. You start sharing your struggles, your victories, your worries, your desires, your dreams. Isn't it ironic in our modern age where we've got all these social media connections that we are starving for time together? People are hungry for connection more than they've ever been. And when communion is done right, it feeds the need to belong. Why? because it moves beyond fellowship and we all start becoming family. Say family. I'm, I'm telling you, God wants us to understand that we're family. What does family really mean? Well, it's around the, the dinner table that I learned my identity. It's around the dinner table that I learned that I was a Van Kempen. It's around the dinner table that I learned that I was of Dutch and Norwegian heritage with a little German thrown in. It's around the dinner table that I learned that, that I was a lefse eater, a krumkaka eater. I know that sounds terrible, but it's actually pretty good, just so you know. A lutefisk eater. Well, I rejected that one, just so you know. Okay? I, that's where I started learning my identity. I remember raising my children, having them sit around the table, and it's around the table that we said, Jesus Christ is number one in our family. That's where, where we would pray, and I would not allow, listen, listen, I would not allow my children to do a rote prayer. There was no, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, let these gifts to us be blessed in Jesus' name, amen. It wasn't a competition to see how fast we could say the prayer and, and then you just dive in and eat. Every child had to learn to pray a unique prayer every single time. Why? Because we were talking to a real God, a real person. We learned that around the table. We showed love and respect for each other around the table. We, we, we shared our love for the word around the table. We were positive people around the table. No whining, no excuses around the table. To come to the communion table is to discover who God is and who you really are. See, this is where you find your identity is at the table. Unfortunately, a lot of our identity is in what we wear. It's in what we drive. It's in our jobs. I'm saddened for, for the younger generation in that, that what is pushed in front of them is, is that you have to be in a reality television program or, or, or you have to be you know, famous in some way or, or have you seen the, the show that's on right now, Boy Band. Do you really want one of your children to be in a boy band? And the reason I ask is, have you noticed that, that two American singers have just committed suicide in the last month? At 41 and 39, something like that? Lead singers, they have all the money, all the fame, everything this world has to offer, and they kill themselves. And that's what our culture is telling our young people is important. I'm here to tell you, it's this table that's important discovering who Jesus Christ is, what was accomplished through his broken body, what was accomplished through his spilt blood. At the table is where we learn who we are, who we belong to, what we're called to, and what we can be in the name of Jesus Christ. So don't forget stories. In the church, we call them testimonies. See, the Bible's not a book of doctrine. You guys understand that, right? The Bible's a book of stories. It's about the story of Joshua. It's about the story of Noah, about the story of, of Rahab. It's about the story of David and the story of Jesus. It's all about stories. That's how we get the gospel out. It's not a set of rules and regulations. People reject rules and regulations. It's about stories. What's happened in your life? Let me hear, what has Christ done for you? 
And when you share your story with your kids, they're gonna wanna become Christians. When you just tell them rules, they're gonna rebel. I'm here to tell you, the kids want to know what happened to you. Why is Jesus so real in your life? The Pharisees lived by rules and regulation. That produced exclusion. Jesus lived by love and grace, and that produced inclusion. So what am I saying? That there's a place at the table for you. There's a place at the table for you. There is always a place set for everyone. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how far away from Jesus Christ you feel today. There is a place at the table for you. Jesus embraces more than the nuclear family. Listen, listen, listen. Jesus actually rejected his own family at times because he was trying to bring people in. Those who feast at Jesus' table become a new kind of family. When we understand communion, it obliterates dissension, tears down walls, ignores bloodlines, and it ends divisions. Everyone at the table is a part. Everyone at the table is equal and accepted. We are the ultimate blended family. So fellowship table, family table, forgiveness table. This is the missing element in most churches. We've not forgiven each other. Can you imagine growing up with your brothers and sisters and never forgiving them? You can't spend time at Thanksgiving or Christmas if there's dissension. Same thing happens in churches all across America because we've spent 10 years together or 20 years together or 30 years together. There is an accumulation of offenses that takes place over time. And it accumulates because we haven't released We haven't forgiven. Every time you come to this communion table, God is saying, have you released every one of their offenses against you? Because it is your job as a Christian. It is your responsibility. Colossians 3.13, make allowance for each other's faults. In other words, no perfect people, no perfect churches, no perfect pastors. We're all screw-ups to some degree. Yeah, that should make all the scripts feel good. Okay? It goes on. And forgive anyone who offends you. Anyone. Just doesn't matter. And it tells you to remember something. The Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So forgiveness is a commandment. Forgiveness is difficult. Forgiveness is uncomfortable, especially when you first start trying it out because it doesn't seem to be natural and normal because it isn't, because our natural and normal tendency is to protect ourselves. And God says, no, 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 let me do the protecting for you. Okay? So you should be quick to forgive. Forgiveness is not a weakness. It is one of the most powerful things you can do. Remember, the most sought after words are I love you. Number two is I forgive you. When you forgive someone, you're doing the the second most powerful thing in the world that you can do for someone. It's the beginning of your own personal healing process. The reason why so many of you are hurt is because you haven't forgiven. I can get you over your hurt like this. Forgive. Make a decision that starting today, I don't care what those persons have done to me. I'm going to trust God to take care of it. I'm not going to be the judge. I'm not going to be the jury. I'm not going to be the executioner. I'm going to let God do that. Because forgiveness doesn't depend on someone else. Reconciliation depends on someone else. Reconciliation is a two-person process. Forgiveness is a one-person process. Forgiveness says, I choose to forgive. What you're doing is you're canceling the debt by choosing to let go your desire to get even, to get revenge, or to hurt the other person. If you don't know how to do this, get a piece of paper out, write down how someone has offended you, and then right across it, canceled. Right across it, paid in full. And you hang it somewhere in your house. You put it in your wallet. So every time you are tempted to rehash what someone's done to you, you pull this to you, oh, oh, that's been paid in full. That's been canceled. I, I, I can't hold aught against anybody any longer. Forgiveness is a gift that you give. It's about how much you trust God. And literally, it sets you free. 
I want to ask everyone to stand up right now for a moment. We still have point three. Point three is to commemorate what it is that Jesus Christ did. Verse 19 says, do this in remembrance of me. Commemorate means to honor the memory of someone or something by a special observance. So communion is all about commemorating the death and the resurrection and the life and the coming back again of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. So how do we commemorate it? We commemorated it by participating in communion. You all can be seated. We're participating. You've participated by walking forward and grabbing your emblems. And as you're seated right now, I want you to think of yourself as if you're seated at a table with Jesus Christ himself. And if Jesus was to look you in the eye and say, son, daughter, do you need forgiveness? How many of you would raise your hand? I would, I'd have to raise my hand. How many of you, if Jesus were to look you in the eye right now and say, are you feeling sick? Are you feeling out of sorts? Are your emotions all out of whack? Is your body hurting you? Do you need healing in any way, shape, or form? How many of you would raise your hand and say, that, that, that's me? You can put your hands down. And finally, how many of you have walked into this place and you're in the middle of a battle? You don't even know where it's coming from. You, you thought you were fighting at work. You thought you were fighting at school. You thought you were fighting a friend. And, and you walked into this house, and, and all of a sudden you're thinking, maybe there's spiritual warfare taking place. How many of you are in the middle of a battle, and you need God to set a table before you in the midst of your enemies? Let me see your hands. You can put your hands down. Some of you are like me. I raised my hand all three times. I'm telling you, I, I feel beat up. And I just got back from vacation. You're supposed to be energized and excited and ready to go. And understand there is a battle. And in the midst of this meal, I believe energy is going to come to our spirits, our souls, and our bodies in Jesus' name. So I want you to grab the bread. Some of you might have wafers. Some of you have, have pieces of bread that have been perfectly cut for us. And I'm so appreciative of that. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of this bread will never be hungry again. I, I mean, this service has just been a, a tip of the iceberg as to what God wants you to understand in regards to the broken body of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 24, all about by his stripes, by his wounds, you were. He uses past tense terminology. It's not even you're going to be. It says you were. God, God took care of this when Jesus Christ died on the cross. So if you need a physical healing, if you need emotional support, if you need God to, to do battle in your mind, I just need you to, to raise the bread, and we're going to pray over it right now. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I say thank you for the broken body of Jesus Christ. I'm so appreciative that the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ went about while he was on this planet healing all who were infirmed. Every single one that he came in contact with that, that needed healing, he healed them miraculously in his name through his Father. So I'm praying today, Father God, that you do a miracle in our physical bodies. Father God, heal my throat. Heal my, my, my elbow. Heal my, my foot, Father God. These, these ailments, these things that have been lingering for a long, long time. Father God, I'm sure there are many in this house who've carried, Father God, things with them for, for weeks or months or, or some even for years, Father God. I pray that today you will do something new in their lives. I pray that there would be a healing, a manifested presence of the Holy Spirit coming upon us supernaturally in Jesus' name. I pray that many of us would begin to sense your, your holiness, your power, your grace in our physical bodies. The scripture says you give power to our mortal flesh, and I'm asking you to do that today in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus took the bread, he passed it to his disciples, and he said, eat this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. Now, if you've got a grape or a cup of juice, A grape means a lot to me. And the reason is, is because when I bite into that grape, the juice kind of spurts in my mouth. And I don't want to be gross. I don't want to be disgusting in any way, shape, or form. But when Jesus was crowned with thorns, I'm sure the blood kind of just burst from his temple area. When Jesus was enthrusted with a spear in his side, I, I'm sure the, the blood kind, kind of burst out. There were times that, that he was whipped with that whip that had, had glass shards in it and metal pieces in it, and, and it hit the back of, his, uh, of him, and it ripped him in such a way that, that it must have been a bloody mess. We sterilize communion. We try and make it so clean and perfect and awesome, and we forget what actually took place. Jesus says that when we eat the bread and drink of this juice, whether it's in a cup or in a grape, we do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to remember what happened to him. We're supposed to remember what it means to us in terms of forgiveness, and we're supposed to remember that Jesus is coming back again someday. Who can say amen to that? If you need forgiveness, would you just raise this grape? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, forgive us. Anyone here who's never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that as they repent of their sins that you would wash them all away. They might not even understand everything that, that needs to take place right now, but Father God, your grace will take care of all of the things that we miss. So I pray, Father God, that you would wash, cleanse, not just of those who've never accepted you, but for the rest of us. I sense that you are standing at the door of Bethel. I sense that you're standing at the door of our church and that you're knocking and asking if we are willing to go the next step with you. And I pray, Father God, that every man, every woman, every young person, every older person, Father God, that we would be willing to do whatever it takes to bring about a revival in the Silicon Valley for your praise and your glory. I pray that we'd be willing to set aside our offenses, that we'd be willing to set aside our judgments, that we'd be willing to set aside even our comforts, Father God, even our wealth, Father God, whatever it is, so that your name will be glorified and that your kingdom would spread. Father God, do something new in our midst today. Forgive us of all of our sins, I pray, in Jesus' name. On the night he was betrayed, he took the cup, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink this in remembrance of me. Will you eat the grape and drink the cup with me in Jesus' name? Would you stand with me, please? I would like to invite uh, prayer partners, elders, pastors to come to the front in case anyone would like further prayer. But I want you to know two closing things. You are not done with communion until you've celebrated to some degree. The word Eucharist literally means thanksgiving. It, it, it's been ironic in my communion experience that for the most part, it's been a, a solemn ceremony throughout. And I just would like to close with a thanksgiving to God. I would like to close with a, a celebratory shout in your, in your voice, in your step, in some way, shape, or form. John Calvin said this, Jesus gave us the blood of Christ in sacrament to exhilarate our souls. 
our salvation, our healing, our deliverance comes through a God who comes to eat with us at a table and to feed us his very presence. Let me close with this. John Miller was an announcer for the Baltimore Orioles for a number of years, and he had a three-minute timer and that timer was there to remind him to say the score every three minutes. Communion is a reminder to communicate to you the score. Jesus wins, devil loses. Jesus has already won, the devil has already lost. So what you prayed for today, what you believed for today, is yours in the name of Jesus Christ.